Hey listeners, welcome to another episode of Brown Girls Read Podcast. This is your host Taman Tiwana. And this is Kathy Thakur. And both of us love reading books. On this podcast, we bring our favorite books to you and discuss the parts that were most meaningful to us and how we found them interesting or relatable as brown girls. Today, we are discussing Unmarriageable by Sonia Kamal, a hilarious, witty Pakistani retelling of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. You know, I picked up this book thinking nothing of it actually. Like, I didn't really know that it was Pride and Prejudice set in Pakistan. When I was reading it, along the way, I was like, this looks like Pride and Prejudice set in Pakistan. <laughs> But even before that realization, I was already so engrossed in the story. This book is so addictive. Amazing portrayal of Pride and Prejudice in a South Asian diaspora. Exactly how you would imagine South Asians to be. But I feel like only like South Asians can understand it. And it seems like it turned out to be a good surprise for you. So you can thank me. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for recommending this book. I couldn't stop reading it. And it's such a witty portrayal of Jane Austen's novel translated to South Asia. Yeah, it's an amazing book. But before we talk more about it, let's tell the listeners that in our next episode, we are also speaking with the author of this book, Sonia Kamal. So stay tuned for that. And now let's talk about this book. I am sure everyone knows Pride and Prejudice at this point, whether it's from reading the original book or because of Colin Firth or the movie starring Keira Knightley or even Gurinder Chadha's Indian remake called Pride and Prejudice starring Aishwarya Rai. So we all know the story, some of us even with the additional modifications. And this book also very closely follows the main story. So I thought it may be more interesting to talk about the characters today. Yeah, because characters were actually really interesting. Uh, some of the characters that I loved were Alice, who's the main protagonist of the book, which is Elizabeth Bennet in the actual Pride and Prejudice. And her dad, I loved her dad as well. And all her sisters, Alice's sisters were amazing. I don't think there's any character in this book that, that I didn't like, except for maybe Darcy's aunt. who's really mean to everyone and a snob. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, but my favorite character in the book was Alice's mom. Like, what an amazing portrayal of, you know, all the misogyny, hypocrisy, <laughs> you know, like all of those stereotypes of being an Indian mom rolled into one. I could picture every Indian auntie in her. I know, I had such a love-hate relationship with her character. Like, you can see all elements of our own parents' generation in her. <laughs> yeah, so many things to talk about her. But let's first get to the main protagonist, Alice Bennett. So the book starts with Alice, who is a teacher in girls' school. And she's asking her students to reimagine the opening sentence of Pride and Prejudice, which is, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Now, Kathy, if you were to reimagine this universal truth, what would you say? I would probably reimagine it as, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune is hunted by the families of daughters <laughs> <laughs> to get him married to them. <laughs> That's true. That's actually a better universal truth. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite universally acknowledged truth from this book? There were actually really good ones. But I think my favorite one is that marriage is a cornerstone of our culture. A truth universally acknowledged because without marriage, our culture and religion do not permit sexual intimacy. Oh my God, this bothers me so much, you know. I mean, yes, like, you know, in our culture, without marriage, sex is taboo. Without marriage, having a child is taboo. But even after marriage, like, you can't talk about your sexual life with anyone. Like sometimes even your friends don't want to discuss. Why? Who do I share it with? Krishan ji ke saath share karu. I mean, he might be the best person for this because From... of all the experience. <laughs> But seriously, I think there's so much shame around this topic, which I feel like is very strategically constructed over the years. And all because someone one day decided that sex is dirty. And it's very ironic and funny coming from a country that's going to be the world leader in population pretty soon. And now that I said this, I kind of feel that maybe suppressed sexual desires are the reason why we are leaders in population. 
<laughs> so true. We are all just hiding our desires at this point, but having kids left, right, and center. I know nobody encourages you to talk about this. Nobody educates you how things are supposed to happen. But the minute you get married, all these aunties start talking about when are you having kids? What are you doing about family planning? <laughs> You can still, in this day and age, see people's fixation with getting their children married as soon as possible. Because I feel in some ways they're trying to beat their desires because what if things went out of order? What would people say? And then there are so many Indian parents who think that they can fix their unruly sons by marrying them off. I'm pretty sure that this is also in some ways rooted in the same thinking where people associate the unacceptable, aggressive behavior with the sexual frustration of boys and think of quote-unquote marriage as a cure. You know, when you start thinking about this, it's actually so degrading as a woman. Yeah, you know, this shows that a woman is just considered a caretaker in our society. And if she doesn't do that well, she isn't a good woman or a good wife or a good mother. And it also reminds me of something that Alice wonders about in the book. Being the protagonist, it's through Alice's eyes that we see the Pakistani culture and society, which isn't too different from the Indian society. Like I mentioned, she's a teacher at girls' school, and we see the fixation with good girls and obedient girls to the point that their education is seen as a mere prop to make them marriageable. And there's a point where Alice wonders about the girls in the school. None of the girls seem to have ever considered traveling the world by themselves let alone being encouraged to do so, or to shatter a glass ceiling, or to laugh like a mad woman in public without a care for how it looked. And that's so true, right? We were also never encouraged to do any of these things. To me, even today, it's hard to imagine a world that would be different from this. Yeah, you know, this reminds me, I used to laugh like a mad woman when I was a kid, and I have heard people... (laughs) It's actually funny how you were a mad woman as a kid before we move on. (laughs) And you know, I heard people saying, if you're so happy now, you will be sad in the future. Oh, I have heard that. It used to be like, don't laugh so much, you will have to cry later. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) like what the fuck? (laughs) Why would you say something like that? I don't know how things become different as boys and girls as you grow up, but I have noticed so many of us learn to like cover our mouths when we laugh. Yeah, that's, yeah, definitely. I think I have never seen a boy covering their mouth when they're laughing. Or maybe I'm thinking it wrong. I don't know. I've never seen that. At least they are not in majority. A lot of girls do, but not, like, I feel like men laugh with, like, their entire bodies and are not embarrassed about any of it. But women are just, like, you know, that playing that role of a good girl in a way. Right. Yeah. And you know, another thing to note is that in this story, it is also made like super evident how women themselves have accepted the roles assigned to them. Because this reminds me of this uh, little kid that was in Alice's class. I don't remember her name, but she was like always, you know, very wary of what Alice was teaching them and she would go and... Oh yeah, kind of a moral police student yeah, in her right. class, yeah. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, people like kids like that, like girls like that or women like that, they have just accepted their roles in the society. And if they see any other woman bypassing that role, you know, they will leave no stone unturned to shame her any chance they get. It's probably, you know, just jealousy manifesting itself. And I don't know what it is, but it's true because I have been like that, you know, like I used to think bad about girls wearing makeup or wearing short skirts or smoking or drinking or having boyfriends. Until I grew up and I was like, all of these things are absolutely necessary for survival. (laughs) What are you doing if you're not doing one of these? Very recently, I was talking to a friend about crop tops. And we were discussing how sari blouses are okay, but crop tops are not. And we just went into this discussion around how even when we are aware of all this, it still triggers something in us when we see an Indian girl wearing a crop top. Because we are not used to seeing them in this image. We still expect them to be good girls in some way. So it just stands out more or scandalizes people much more than seeing like, let's say, a white girl in a similar outfit. Yeah, you know, that happens. And it also doesn't end there. I think even like as women ourselves or as a society, we, we downplay women's roles in society as well. Like, for example, 
like this has got nothing to do with the book but do you know of that incident where a guy raped a girl in a college in india like in some iit and the authorities did not put any charge on the guy because apparently he's an asset to the future and other women are supporting this ruling saying that the girl's reputation was anyway not very clean so not only do we not let women break their assigned roles in our society incidents like these have made it very clear that even today we think of women as liabilities because no one talks about their future about how this woman who got raped wanted to become a scientist or a doctor everyone just went to the guy and said oh his future looks promising so him raping another human being should be discounted yeah i heard about that case too and sadly i wasn't surprised because we have seen that repeatedly men's futures are prioritized over women's lives and women's futures are not even considered a woman in this society has to be a goddess like an epitome of fantasized purity for her to get any respect regardless of from men from women the society is just like that and i know this discussion is a segue from our book but you know this is the reason why i now hate it when people compare good women to goddesses because to me what it says is that there is no room for me as a human forget being a flawed one yeah definitely and we also keep comparing moms to goddesses like the role of a mother is that of a goddess that brings such a huge disappointment to a human being who's a mother because they're like i'm flawed and i don't know how to take care of this little person yeah it adds so much pressure right because you yeah. are just set up for failure that you have to be this idea of a mom you can't right. be a mom as yourself you have to be this idea of a mom it's strongest as a mom i feel like because there's a lot of this rhetoric of mother as a goddess mother india and like you know what not yeah <laughs> like a sacrificing woman but you can yeah. also see that as wives you are supposed to be sacrificing you see all these movies where as a woman of the house you are supposed to eat last you are supposed to give your food to everyone else i'm picturing all these old movies right now where you will see like these moms they will not eat the roti because there were only two rotis and give to the husband and the child and like yeah. stuff like that <laughs> but it's so harmful like and we have grown up on movies like this and subconsciously who knows who has learned what from that so true oh god please okay i just don't want to sacrifice on anything <laughs> <laughs> me either i'm okay I, not I'm being okay. a goddess i'm okay not being respected <laughs> yeah. by you that's fine <laughs> Now let's also talk about another character in the book, Sherry, who is Alice's best friend. She's older than Alice and she's still unmarried. Reason being that she's reproductively challenged and also her family isn't rich enough to pay her dowry. To me, she is the perfect example of what we were talking about earlier. You can see that she does not care who she was getting married to. She didn't have any high standards for the man. The only thing she was sure about was that if she was ever going to have sex it was going to happen through marriage to me she was this very practical person who accepted how things are in that culture and had this attitude of let's play with the cards we are dealt you know that is such a different idea of sherry to me when i was reading about sherry she seemed to me that she would be stronger than that like she would probably be like i am tired of the society and all of the things people expect me to do So you know she would go and have sex with someone and just be happy that way. But eventually she gets married to a lunatic maybe because she was so discouraged from all the pressure that's put on her like 35 and unmarried not being able to have a child etc. Yeah, I think through Sherry's character Sonia has shown us the reality of that culture in a way. Like it does not matter how strong or independent you are at the end of the day your worth is still determined by your marital status and your children which is a reality still like the degrees of pressure may vary for people but some level of pressure is always there you can see in the book she is treated as a burden by her siblings and that's how society thinks of women still right like as a burden that's handed from one family to another we have heard all these things like paraya dhan and all that which were like constant reminders of this thing for girls yeah so true but you know i still imagine a different story for sherry but maybe you know like alice later realized that as long as sherry is happy being married to farad kalim it's fine so 
Okay, so you also accepted it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what can I do? <laughs> I mean, I would have liked it, you know, if she opened her business and went on to become like the first billionaire woman in Pakistan. But like we all know, it's so it's so difficult to, you know, break apart from the shackles of the expectations that your parents have from you or, you know, that other society members have from you. It's just very difficult. It's very different when you're a woman. But she does eventually weasel her way out to do something of her own, which I loved, which is why I think she was very smart. She accepted what is and then worked around it. Yeah, that's true. And it is said in the book that there are few fates more petrifying to a Pakistani girl than downward mobility. I think Sherry's character was very aware of this fact. And she figured out a way for herself for upward mobility, even in her real lives. We would want to think that this concept doesn't exist. This isn't the case. But I feel there is a great deal of truth in this whole situation. I remember there was something in the book where Alice's mom is thinking about getting her daughters married to someone. And then she thinks about some NRI guys. She decided that she wouldn't want her daughters to go abroad and become unpaid help at home while also being isolated, then becoming exhausted, homesick, depressed. I know for you and me, this may not be the case because we follow different paths. We studied and worked here, but I think it's still very much a reality for many women who accompany their husbands to the US or other countries, especially in the US. Like if your husband is on H-1B visa, he can go out and work, but you as a spouse get the H-4 visa. So for years, you cannot work here. And that puts them in this role of housewife, whether they want it or not. And strips away their freedom to choose a life, to even walk away if they need to. And I feel like that's a different kind of downward mobility. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there are so many restrictions that I have also seen. A lot of my friends who got married and moved to the US and now they're on H4 visas, they are just stuck. That's definitely true. And I think Mrs. Binet had a good sense of understanding of what the, what she wanted her children's futures to look like. But, you know, if you look at it in a different way as well, I feel like, you know, it was such a great example of how parents just want to control their kids. Like Alice's mom has an idea about how her daughter's future would be when she's married versus when she goes abroad to work. But she didn't wait wait to ask her daughters what it is that they want. You know, like parents are just afraid to let their children make mistakes. And I totally understand that. But sometimes that backfires pretty badly. Because what are you doing in life if you're not making mistakes? Like parents sometimes just need to back off. Well, Kathy, good girls don't make mistakes, first of all. Secondly, we are talking about a South Asian mom here. (laughs) Oh yeah, that's so true. I forgot for a second. How can South Asian moms back off from anything? (laughs) (laughs) And you know, since we were talking about Sherry, should we also talk about the man she married? Yes, please. Let's do that. Farhat Kali. Like this man was getting so many emotions out of me when I was reading. (laughs) I feel like he's a personification of most men in the Indian plus Pakistani society for me. A lot of the men, even in reality, they just want their wives and women in general to follow some rules while they themselves are shallow, extremely vain and judgmental. And this is exactly what Farad Kalin was. You know, reading about him, I was like, why do women have to pretend to be something that they're not? Why do women have to pretend to be helpless? Pretend to be sad, pretend to be lonely, pretend to be quiet. Like, why? Like, you remember this this scene where he was like, okay, so Alice is, you know, doesn't talk much. Maybe she's so shy, you know, that's why she doesn't talk much to me. (laughs) I'm like, no, she just doesn't like you. Like, why can't you accept the fact? And that's why she doesn't want to talk. (laughs) I don't think their brains can even comprehend that as an option that someone doesn't (laughs) want to talk to them. (laughs) So they have to construct all these stories that, oh, this girl is too shy or something is wrong with the girl. She has an attitude or something like that. Nothing nothing is wrong with these men. Yeah, to me, it feels like Farad Kadin was unmarriageable, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have figured it out, the title yeah. of the book. <laughs> yeah. Usually, you know, I would like cut him some slack because he is a product of the patriarchy as well. But if you're living in 2021 and you're still a misogynist and intolerant of minorities and other cultures, you deserve to be shamed, I think. Also, did you notice his heartbroken speech when Alice refused his proposal? He said that Alice is lucky that he is not the type to throw acid on a girl for refusing him. 
like what the fuck we should be grateful every moment of our lives <laughs> people is... don't want to throw acid at our faces <laughs> this, this is our life <laughs> i know we are laughing about this and making jokes but seriously this is a real problem in our community where men think like this where they are like oh i am a great husband because at least i'm not beating up my wife and it also manifests in like their families i feel like it was more common in our culture in olden days that there used to be some sort of physical abuse from like guys parents and the guys themselves so this yeah. generation just feels so much better about themselves for not being that and they expect the women to be just grateful and nobody sees the irony in that yeah and i also think it highly depends right in a country like india there's no just there's no one india right so yes for our generation for our economic strata all of these things have died down but like there are these things happening still in different communities and different states like this is a huge problem but coming back to the book it's sad that even after farhat kalin said all of those things to alice alice's mother knowing full well what kind of a person he is was still ready to get alice married to him you know it seems like sometimes our parents get this shaadi ka bhoot on their heads and that just doesn't go away that's I true i think that bhoot starts with our childhoods like or the moment we are born i remember there used to be like all these conversation about like our weddings even when we were like 4 or 5 years old or something <laughs> wow you know as a kid wedding is pretty fun idea i yeah. remember one of my aunts got married and all i saw was her getting new dresses her getting jewelry <laughs> and there used to be all this like delicious food at home all the time so why would i hate a wedding right but yeah. <laughs> as a kid i did not understand that wedding and marriage are different <laughs> <laughs> marriage is a real thing wedding is a fairy tale <laughs> no we all want weddings but yeah. probably very few of us want marriages <laughs> we all want like five or six weddings in our lives <laughs> i know right the whole big fat indian wedding you get yeah. like five days of dressing up and like, yeah. eating all that food <laughs> but marriage that's a different thing <laughs> one is enough and yeah i don't see why marriage is such a huge deal anyway you know like just so we don't die alone our parents want us to get married to anyone how is this a rational decision i don't think any of the decisions are rational <laughs> they were just handed this checklist oh yeah which their parents followed and they are following the same yeah. and nobody stops to question like why are we doing this yeah exactly but you know coming back to farhat kali i do want to say that her heart fared much better than the previous match that came for sherry you know that gross old man who wanted her oh. to massage him and read erotic texts in the name of wifely <laughs> duties that is and so in true. front of the whole family right <laughs> yeah this is where we are now plus one for farhat <laughs> yeah we are doing the same thing we were talking about where we are like at least he is not as bad as this guy <laughs> yeah sherry did the same i think yeah but you know looking back i still feel farhat was the most realistically written man in this book because if you see valentine darcy and bungles and all these other guys they were like book princes who do so not true. exist in real life <laughs> oh god darcy is not realistic at all selfless good looking extremely rich arrogant but good at heart where do you find men like him in books or in romcom movies i think yeah man sadly there are no real darcys <laughs> let's just take a break and go cry for a bit <laughs> i'm just mad well then let's channel this energy into the most important character the mom kushboo oh, binay yeah. yes like you said earlier she is a really well written character she makes you cringe she makes you infuriated and she even makes you feel this self pity for being born into this culture <laughs> <laughs> yeah mrs binad alice's mom is someone i can totally see my mom in actually it was you know <laughs> sonia studied my mom and wrote mrs binet but you know early on i thought that sure like you know she's she does all of these stupid stuff like forcing her daughters to throw themselves at rich men but in her heart she would care a little bit about you know who her daughters should marry apart from you know how rich the man is but when she forced alice to accept farhat kalin's proposal as like damn this is the worst mom ever i know that was like the lowest of the lows and you know there were moments when i thought that she's acting this way out of love 
because she does not want her daughters to struggle like she did or some other justification like that she would then go ahead and frustrate me again <laughs> so true <laughs> and there's a point where mrs binad is telling her daughter jenna that once you're married you can do anything you want alice jumps in and she says that's a lie it's a dangling carrot to lure us into marriage so my question to you is what versions of this dangling carrot have you heard oh my god so many you can travel wherever you want to with your husband <laughs> man i think that is like something all of us have heard that's the most basic one right like <laughs> <laughs> every time you are like mom can i go to goa travel with your husband okay <laughs> and you're 18 years old and i'm like okay so you have to wait for next 10 years to <laughs> to go to goa <laughs> and it's such a effective way to shut you up Of course yeah 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 of course because then you're like you don't have any rebuttal for this right you're just like dumbfounded what just happened <laughs> yeah because you look for logic and there's no logic <laughs> and you you just say stuck in that and your parents have moved on to other things <laughs> you know i have even heard that cut your hair after you're married oh yeah 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 like you know yeah grow your hair look pretty before yeah so basically married. don't do anything that will get in the way of you getting a match in yeah. lines of mrs binner grab the man first and then cut your hair <laughs> yeah and after that go bald no one cares <laughs> it's you and your man <laughs> and also like you could easily marry a man who then like has a problem with that but then parents yeah. are like it's not a problem we are not stopping you anymore it's your husband now now he's the bad guy <laughs> so true i have heard another one you can study further if your in laws allow you to like i know my friends who have heard this Oh, yeah, I think that's also a very common one. Where parents are like, "We don't want to pay for your studies; just get yeah. married." We have only limited funds, which can which can go towards your studying or your marriage. And somehow, marriage is more yes. important. Yes, <laughs> always. <laughs> I have actually even heard like a modification or like a version of this. One of my friends, she was told that she can work wherever she wants after after she gets married. She got married, and the in laws didn't want her to work. Poor girl, she was like a topper in her college, and she had to fight for years for her to get permission to work. Somehow, this only happens to toppers, right? Like they will get people who are super rich, and they're like, <laughs> "My daughter-in-law doesn't need to get married." And for See, people like us who are like failures, I know this goes back to the book, right? Where education is like a way to get a good guy. So if you're a topper, you get like oh, yeah. a rich, richer guy, maybe. <laughs> That's yeah. why <laughs> no one told us to not work. No one told us to stay at home and relax and chill and you know just spend money. It's not chilling, to be honest. There's a reason she was fighting to get out of us. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yeah, <laughs> we are just bad people, I think. <laughs> you know, I have even heard like very petty versions of this dangling carrot where they're like, you can wear whatever clothes after you are married. What does that mean? Don't I think it's short. again like. in terms of now you have to look like a good girl like a sanskari yeah. girl so that someone will marry you and also like after you're married it's not our problem what you wear what you don't nobody can say anything to us <laughs> <laughs> well you know this list is endless actually and i guess our listeners might have more things to share so if you have anything leave a comment we would like to know different versions of this and now let's move on to brownie points kya thi yeah let's move to brownie points First brownie point is for Kitty's character. I loved her, and she grew to be this unabashedly body positive girl, which I think is a big feat for any girl in our toxic body shaming part of the culture. She was also very refreshing to read as a reader. Yeah, definitely plus one for that. I love Kitty's character as well. I'll give another brownie point for the audio book version of this book. If you still haven't listened to it, Kathy, please do. You have to. Sonia has narrated it herself and she's just amazing at the voice acting especially the mom's character i just loved the book okay yeah i have to do that you have been you told me about this audio book you know i'll get it definitely and you know i really like the dad's character too like he was a little voice of reason in all of this chaos that his wife mrs bennett created from time to time <laughs> <laughs> i like how you put that <laughs> That was another realistic character, but yeah, I would give one brownie point for creating super realistic South Asian characters in this portrayal of of a Jane Austen classic. Except maybe Darcy, but you know there has to be some magic in stories in general. Yeah, something we can feel hopeful about. Something to cling on to. <laughs> <laughs> 
one day that, that's why people keep getting married <laughs> <laughs> and now before we end the episode kathy what are you reading right now i am reading this uh, book we were never here it's a thriller and we are going to cover this in our episodes as well that is amazing that's so addictive so addictive so addictive yeah i haven't started it yet but your reviews are making me want to right now <laughs> and i'm reading another uh, non fiction called anti fragile things that gain from disorder that's okay i'm still you know trying to get the hang of that book like it's written in a very weird way but <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem with non fiction sometimes it becomes textbook like for me yeah right what are you reading i'm reading this book called infinite country by patricia angel uh, it's a fiction which talks about a family that's been divided by immigration it's very nuanced about undocumented people in US and how life is in countries outside of US it's not a long book it's under 200 pages but amazingly written and i'm also listening to this book called braiding sweet grass it's a science non fiction which is about plants and lands and the coexistence of humans and nature with this indigenous wisdom and traditional learning the book is written so beautifully you know it's it sounds poetic i just can't get enough of it Yeah it sounds really interesting I think I'm going to pick that up That's all for today for our next episode we are going to speak with the author of this book Sonia Kamal Don't miss out and until then keep listening Thank you for listening to this episode of Brown Girls Read podcast If you like what you hear please leave us a five star rating and a comment You can support us at anchor.fm/browngirlsread/support Your support will allow us to continue this podcast and bring more episodes to you. Don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Instagram Brown Girls Read Pod and Brown Girls Read One on Twitter. If you have book recommendations for us, you can leave us a comment or message on our social media and you can also subscribe to us on YouTube for more content.